But for uh, talking about me, I'm going to talk about uh, deprogramming and it being a fun language to write code in. Because after all, if you're going to spend a lot of time writing code, wouldn't you want it to be fun? I mean, why make yourself miserable on your career? The first question I always get asked is, uh, why D instead of C? And I've had lots of responses to that, but I thought I'd try an analogy this time. That's my car. Does anybody know what kind of car that is? Yeah, I Challenger? Who said Challenger? <laughs> Char and that's not a Charger. It's a Challenger, so close. What year is it for the true aficionados? 69? Eh, nope, nope. They didn't make Challenger in 69. 74? Very close. Well, it's a 72. And it's a very fast car. As long as you don't try anything interesting like turning or braking. <laughs> and it's not very safe. You really don't want to hit anything with that car. <laughs> uh, it's high maintenance. And worst of all, it has no cup holder. So if you're drinking coffee, steering, and shifting gears at the same time, somebody loses. <laughs> <laughs> and we all know you don't want to carry coffee between your knees because you know what happens when that, <laughs> you do that, <laughs> especially if you're driving fast. Um, but I love the car anyway. Um, I should give you a secret. You know, most compiler guys tend to have fast cars. Something about it goes with the territory. And amazingly, C is a right about the same vintage. <laughs> It's very fast. Uh, you don't want to try anything clever like dangling pointers. It's high maintenance, and it has no cup holder features. You have to, uh, you know, hold the cup between your knees with it. And you'd think, after 40 years, we could do better than C. Don't you think, think there's been uh, programming language progress in 40 years? I do. There's been a heck of a lot of progress. So I'll show you a couple of examples of it. OK, who knows what movie this is from? <laughs> oh, you guys are too young. <laughs> Only one guy, yeah. <laughs> OK, this is Clint Eastwood as Dirty Harry in Magnum Force. And the problem is, a typical problem in C or many programming languages is you have one followed by a bunch of zeros. And how many people know how many zeros are there? Are there five or six? Six. Are you sure? Did any of you do it without counting? No. No, you had to sit there. Have you ever sat there with a, you know, the tip of a pencil on the screen going one, two? Then you come back tomorrow and you think, is it really that? And then you do that. Because, you know, I'm obsessive compulsive and I've got to do it three times. <laughs> so the idea is, do you feel lucky? Well, yeah, that, that looks like a cup holder kind of problem. So anyhow, in D, you can just simply insert underscores in there. Now, how many know there are six digits without counting? Yeah, it forms a pattern. Your brain's really good at picking up patterns. So, and you know, different kind of numbers have different patterns. Like, you know, the U.S. phone number. I know I'm in the wrong country for that, but um, I guess you don't have social security numbers. But you do have credit cards. You know, four sets of four digits. So it's much easier to recognize, you know, that number's a credit card or that number is a date by inserting a little extra formatting in there, just the same way that you'd put commas in. Except I don't recommend putting credit card numbers in your source code and then posting it to GitHub. <laughs> that could get you in trouble with the banks if you try that. <laughs> but you might have credit card numbers in your you know, test numbers to have in your test database. 
but you know, there's some things you can do in C that we subtracted from D, and one of them is octal numbers. How many people use octal numbers in C? What, three people? <laughs> octal numbers, what are they used for in C? Come on, you guys, what do you use octal numbers in C for? Protocols? Register mappings. It's also used like for file permissions and things like that. Read, write, execute is three bits. Fits in an octal digit. Well, so sometimes you need them. If you wanted to do those in decimal, they wouldn't look anything like what the spec says they're supposed to be. So let's write a little template here. This is a template function in D. And it has an argument n. And here we're multiplying by 8, dividing by 10, multiplying by the power. And what it's doing is converting this number from octal into decimal. And being a template, it all happens at compile time. So what that enables us to do, this bang means compile time template or compile time parameters are coming. So octal bang 100 actually gives you the number 64 back. So here with a bit of template magic, I've created my own ability to create my own user-defined literals, which is really cool. Because now, if you have a special kind of data type or something, you can create your own literals without having to change the language. So octors are very trivial. Let's try something a little more uh, daring. Who knows what half float is? Uh, one person. Okay, the normal floating point values are in a typical language. They give you floats, which are 32 bits, and doubles, which are 64 bits. And sometimes they give you long doubles or reals, which are 80 bits or even longer. But when you have huge numbers of floats you want to deal with, the size becomes a problem. And so the idea of a half float came up. And there's a Wikipedia entry on half floats, it's 16 bits long. And this is the format. It's got a sign bit, 5-bit exponent, 10-bit mantissa. So how are we going to make this work in D? We need a strategy. So we want it to be fast, so we want to use the 32-bit float hardware to do the computations, because if we wrote a software emulator, for 16-bit floating point code is going to be really, really, really slow compared to the hardware. We want to use the 16 bits only for storage. And when we think about it, it's analogous to the way shorts work in C. Whenever you use a short in C, what's the first thing it does if you're using short arithmetic in C? Come on, I know a lot of you guys are C programmers. Integral promotions, converts it to an int. First thing it does, and then it does the operation on an int as if it was an int. So the first thing it does with a 16-bit short in C is convert it to a 32-bit int. So we're going to do the same thing. We're going to create our type, call it a half float. And there are pretty much uh, four pieces of data in here. We're going to use a U short down here to store our actual bit pattern for our half float. And we've statically initialized it to a NAN, which is a not a number. It's sort of like null pointers. It's not a real pointer. NAN is not a number. Then we have a constructor, which takes a float and calls this function, which converts it to the 16-bit format. Not shown here because that's a fairly chunky piece of code, doesn't fit on the slide. And we have the inverse function, which converts a short back into a float, or a half float back into a regular float. And then we have this funny little thing, alias to float this. And that's the magic ingredient in all this, because what that does is if I want to do an operation on a type and the compiler cannot find that operation, in the declarations here, this command says call the toFloat member function and then try again. So what toFloat does 
is it returns it as a float, and then all of a sudden, plus, minus, multiply, divide, all the floating point operations suddenly start working. So that's actually a complete set of code there. We can even do like the octal thing and make a user-defined literal, which we call hf, bang, and then our float, floating point literal there, and it converts it, and the key is at compile time to a half float. The end result of that is we can use it just like we'd use shorts in C. We can initialize a half float using a literal. Adding two half floats gives a float as a result. We can cast it back to a half float. And we can build a half float out of a floating point value. And if we just add two half floats, we get a float result. So now we have exactly what we want. We have our half size float and it uses the floating point hardware on your chip. And uh, we have our user-defined literals. And we didn't have to change the language at all. So the next feature I find extremely important in D, and this is building up to that, but first, coverage analysis. Coverage analysis is seeing, running your test program, and then seeing what parts of your code actually executed. So, any of you see guys recognize this function? Yes? What is it? Yes? It's the sieve of Aristosthenes, the classic C benchmark, which computes a bunch of prime numbers and is kind of often used to show off how good your compiler is at compiling code. And we want to compile it with dash cov to do coverage analysis. And when we run it, we get a report that looks like this. And those numbers on the left side are how many times each line of code was executed. OK, so that's, that's cute. What are we going to do with that? Anybody got any great ideas what you can do with coverage analysis? Uh, I gave you a hint before. Oh, man. <laughs> okay, unit tests, or how do I know my tests actually tested the code? How many people ship code without ever running it? Come on, everyone raised their hands. <laughs> you may not know it, but you're not running your code. If you, how many people run a coverage analyzer? OK, you four people actually have a possibility of your code is being tested before you ship it. Because I know for a fact when I run a coverage analyzer on something that's never been, it's never been run on, it's like, uh, you know, you're, you're only running a third of your code. So let me give an example. We wrote a trivial function, and this happens to me all the time. I write a trivial function that tests to see if a character is a letter or not. Now here's the D feature of interest. It has unit tests built into the language. It's not a bag on the side. It's not a third party tool. It's actually part of the language. And I can put in there a bunch of tests that call is alpha on various characters and test to see if I get the expected result back. So here's how we compile it. We want to do our coverage test. We want to run the unit tests. And since there's no main in the function, we want it to generate a default main for it. So here's our coverage result. And we see something interesting here. This line's never executed. Now that tells us our tests are incomplete. And down at the bottom, it gives a report that says only 85% of the lines are actually executed. And we want, before we ship, we want 100% of the lines executed because although that doesn't guarantee your code is bug free, we found that the number of bugs found in the released product is, 
at least an order of magnitude lower than if we hadn't run the coverage, coverage analysis on it and got every line of code executed. Turns out you find, a lot about, find out a lot about your code with this. And I mentioned before about this being a trivial function, you don't need to test it, OK? How many times is, have you written trivial functions that you didn't need to test and find they were broken? I still do it. <laughs> or should I say Goofy does it? Huh. Happens to me all the time. I thought, you know, if I check in this code and I don't run the coverage test, somebody's going to ding me that I didn't run the coverage test. So <laughs> rather than be humiliated, I go, ah, you know, I know it's right, but I'll write a couple unit tests, and I discover it doesn't work. Happens to me all the time. So I find this to be an invaluable tool. Um, one of the projects I discuss later in here is the warp preprocessor I wrote for, um, for Facebook. And I decided everything from the bottom up was going to be 100% unit tested. And the program went together much, much, much faster than I expected simply because I had gotten 100% unit test coverage on it. And in the field, it had very, very few bugs show up in the field. So this works. So I also get asked what companies are using D. The biggest company that uses D is Sociomantic. They're based out of Berlin. Uh, they're hosting the D conference next year. And they're a $200 million company. And their entire company runs on D. They do uh, auctioning and trading. Uh, real-time trading, and they've told me they regard D as their not-so-secret secret weapon. <laughs> um, you can write code that is extremely fast in D. There's also a Wikipedia entry. There's a URL for it where uh, there's a list of companies that use D for their projects. So you have a nice overview of people who are being successful using D. Some D projects I've done. First off, the D front end to the compiler. And I actually didn't write it in D. I wrote it in C++. And one of the self-selected developers, Daniel Murphy, wrote a program to convert C++ to D. And so we just released uh, version 2.069 of the D compiler. And it is now written in D, so it's self-hosting which is a major uh, milestone for us and pretty cool. And that's pretty much due to uh, Daniel Murphy's work making this happen. I talked about Warp. Warp was written as a demonstration project to show how fast decode can be. And it's way faster than the GNU preprocessor and about the same speed as the Clang preprocessor, except it was written in an extremely short amount of time. Another one is a JavaScript compiler I wrote years ago and converted into D manually. And at the time I wrote it, around 2000, it was the fastest uh, JavaScript engine out there. It's uh, since been supplanted because people keep finding ever faster ways, ways to make JavaScript work. <laughs>